Hello there, welcome to another podcast. Uh, I'm here with Valerie and Todd. Todd, Chief Executive at Hemsley Fraser, Valerie Executive Consultant. Welcome both. We are here today to talk about leadership in the digital age um, with a particular focus on, on the six traits that we've identified at Hemsley Fraser. So if I could come to you first, Todd, um, and just ask you what you think um, has changed about leadership in the digital age? I, I guess the first thing for me, uh, John, is, is really even the definition of who is the leader. Uh, from my position, that feels like that's a major shift. We've uh, talked about concepts of personal leadership for years, but we're really in an environment now where everybody can be a leader in the business, regardless of their position. Uh, when I think about traditional leadership, uh, we used to refer to it coming from various sources of power is that position power or expertise or information but for me in the digital environment this is all changing the digital tools that we have allow us to lead flatter organizations information is more transparent and not hoarded expertise is more easily shared and transferred so in this sort of inclusive approach everyone has the same tools and the information available and that includes stuff that used to be reserved for just the you know appointed leader so I, I think for me, this combines with a new generation that thankfully is more entrepreneurial and expect to be empowered. And uh, this becomes a natural transition. Valerie, is that, do you agree with that? Is there anything else to add? Absolutely. I think that particularly as we've seen multiple generations in the workplace, that kind of behavior shift has spread from one generation to another. So it's simply becoming more the way that people behave generally than it ever used to be. I, I was just going to add to that. I mean, we've read a lot lately about what they're calling sort of the gig economy, uh, which means people move from job to job on their own flexible terms. They pursue their own goals, their own passions, the ability to manage themselves. And, and we see this in the rising popularity of these live, work, play communities. All of this really changing what a dynamic of the workplace looks like. And I, I think it's really the employers uh, you know, uh, requirement now to figure out how do we create that same sort of uh, flexibility within the structure of a traditional organization? Because it, you know, if we don't, we it leads to retention, talent erosion, loss of institutional knowledge, and and these are things that we need to be thinking about. And so, as well as the um, the individuals changing and the, the the organization changing, are we therefore thinking there's also the way that we develop leaders is changing? Well, I think I think that to a great extent. The way that we develop leaders has been changing for quite some time. Um, once upon a time, it was simply, as Todd was referring, um, something where somebody was passing the baton to a particular person. And the emphasis on development pretty much wasn't there because it was assumed that if you were holding the baton, you were de facto leader. And that was it. And then we started saying, well, maybe there are specific characteristics that good leaders exhibit. We started looking at competencies and characteristics. And what the research we're finding today is telling us is that it does seem that the people who are the most successful at leading in the current work environment exhibit a number of traits, but it's no longer like a single list of traits. It's a pairing of traits. And there's a general acknowledgment that the two traits that are paired need to be balanced against each other. And that, that is the real key that makes for a really strong leader in the new economy and in the new way that we work and interact together. Moving on to those pairings, Valerie, if I, could I stay with you just for the, the first, which is curiosity and critical thinking. Could you just explain to us what your understanding of that is? Sure. Um, Good leaders have to be almost insatiably curious. They're the ones who need to be asking why all of the time. They're the ones who need to be putting things together that other people didn't necessarily put together. So what, what did you hear about um, in the news? How does that relate to products? How does that relate to customers? And the curiosity to dig below the surface on all of those things is a trait that good leaders need to have. So they're constantly exploring and really getting curious all of the time. But if all you do is get curious, then it, it's like going down the rabbit hole. It's like when I try to look something up online 
and I get distracted and forget what I was looking for originally, so I get lost. The balance to being curious, the, the other trait that needs to be gained and developed is critical thinking. So effective leaders need to not only get curious, not only need to ask, um, could we do this a different way? Could we expand into a different marketplace? Could we improve our product? They need to be bringing critical thinking to the table to be saying, well, that's all well and good, but if we do that, what's going to happen? What are the unintended consequences? Who's going to benefit? Who might be harmed? Is this going to move us towards our overall strategic goals as an organization? So it, it's sort of the marriage of could we do this and should we do this? So you need the curiosity to determine whether you should go down another path and the critical thinking to say, and if we go down that critical that other path, is that going to get us where we need to go ultimately, or is it a side trail we really don't have the resources to explore, at least at this time? And is that something you see, Todd, organizations grappling with in the current climate? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that impacts all of us in, in work and personal life is just the sheer amount of information overload that we're dealing with. And when you've got this constant barrage of new information coming in, um, you know, daily, if not hourly or by the minute, um, you know, you're, you're, you can be easily in a situation of, um, you know, organizational paralysis in trying to cut through that. And the more curious you are about about things, the more you feel that you have to process all that information and recalibrate uh, direction. Uh, so a, a part of this is sorting through that and understanding what the real big impact areas are and having the critical thinking skills uh, to help people make those uh, differentiations for themselves. Great. And, that, and so the second uh, pair of traits, back to you, Valerie, is uh, the vulnerability and confidence and how those two uh, play off each other. Um, one of the things we're finding that good leaders do is they model the behaviors that they want their employees and their team members to exhibit. And one of those has to do with vulnerability. And the vulnerability, I think, for the most part, is the willingness to say, I don't know. Um, we've got three paths that we could choose for a way forward. I'm not absolutely certain which one is the best. Why don't we get together as a team and have a discussion about it? Um, that I don't know is a behavior you really want to model for people. You want to make it acceptable to say, I don't know, rather than to have people afraid to exhibit that degree of vulnerability and potentially to go off and try doing something that they really don't know how to do, which could have disastrous consequences. The other piece of the vulnerability, aside from admitting that you don't know everything, has to do with admitting that sometimes you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Every organization may have mistakes that simply cannot be made, where the consequences of the mistake are so dire that we have absolutely no room for it. But in most cases, you can make mistakes. If the message that leaders send to people is that if you own up to making a mistake, if you take the accountability for having made a mistake, that there's somehow a terrible price to be paid for that, an embarrassment to be made, to be associated with that, people aren't going to do it. They're going to tend to paper over the mistakes that they've made and hope nobody notices, which could lead to larger problems down the road. If a, a good leader exhibits the willingness to be vulnerable in this way, to say, I've made mistakes, and let's use that as a learning opportunity. How did this happen? What do we learn from it? What could we do to make sure it never happens again? That behavior then becomes acceptable for the team, which is a place that you want to go. But you don't want a leader to be so vulnerable that they don't appear to have confidence in themselves and in the decisions they're making. And you don't want them to be so vulnerable that their teams don't have confidence in them. So you need to marry up the willingness to be vulnerable with the confidence to say, OK, now we've had that conversation about which of these three paths is correct. I'm now going to make the decision. I'm going to move this in the right direction. And that 
willingness to actually make that call to show the confidence that you're moving the team in the right way also engenders confidence that the team will have in the leader. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I completely agree. I'm, uh, as you were talking, I was just recalling actually an executive coach that I worked with years ago, and it's, it, it's one of the lessons that stood out the most for me uh, in the sessions with him, which was a, a simple lesson called the power of I don't know. Um, and, you know, he, he forced us to go through a, a number of days where we just simply, every time we didn't know something, we admitted it. And it was amazing, even from the leader's perspective, how freeing that was, because, you know, in the old model, you were expected to know everything, or at least pretend that you did. And with that always came this certain level of angst of, well, I'm not really sure, but I need to portray that I'm sure. And it, it was just such a freeing moment to be able to say, well, I, I don't know. And what you got from that, aside from the personal freedom, was that you got a lot more input from everybody else. Uh, because they felt uh, the freedom themselves then to step into the conversation as opposed to just waiting you, for you to provide an answer. And that seems to me to be sort of a similar thread with the third pair of traits, Valerie, which is empathy versus decisiveness, where, you know, I guess the decisiveness you would expect historically was part of leadership, whereas empathy maybe wasn't. Todd mentioned earlier um, the degree to which inclusivity is becoming more and more critical in an organization. And as organizations flatten and we get greater digital tools that engender better communications, it's becoming increasingly important. The piece that I think is important for a leadership trait when you talk about empathy is not the idea of, oh, I feel your pain, I feel your pain. It's the idea that good leaders want to be sensitive to and aware of the differences of all of their employees. They want to know what is it that is in your background, in your communication preferences, in the ways that you hear things that are going to potentially require that I communicate differently to you in order to make sure that I've got you on board that it's the how do I get everybody's input when I'm actively trying to get it. It's that kind of empathetic engagement. And I think one of the crucial things with this is that it is all too easy in the press of urgency. There's so many things shouting for our attention that it's very easy to forget that if we just say things one way, or communicate in one mode, or just announce to the entire staff, um, I need you to come to me if you see anything that's going wrong. Well, if somebody's from a culture in which you simply do not give that kind of feedback to somebody who is above you in a hierarchy, you're not going to get that feedback. So it's taking a step back sometimes and saying, how do I make sure that I've engaged everybody and gotten their input and made it a safe place for them to give me that input. That has to get balanced by the decisiveness. If you're constantly striving to get input from everybody, you might never stop getting input. Mm -hmm. At some point, good leaders know when they've gotten the input that they need, they've shared out the input that, that employees or teammates need to hear or that colleagues need to know, and they're simply going to make the call. I know in organizations that I have worked with over the years, the biggest single complaint, one of the most common complaints that I hear, is that, that somebody who is further up the food chain just never makes a decision. They'll never make a call. It's as if there's a reluctance to put that stake in the sand. So mm. good leaders make those decisions and then act on them. Real tension in this pairing too, isn't it, Valerie? Because you know, when you reach the end of that, so even if you've, if you've gone about the decision-making process in exactly the right way and gathered the input and considered uh, different perspectives and feelings, you reach the point of decision and you think, okay, the decision itself is not going to be popular, and how am I supposed to take this tough decision while still being empathetic? And, you know, if you don't get the balance right on that tension, it can grind you to a point where you feel uncomfortable making the actual decision. So I, I think, you know, the tension between this particular pairing comes all the way back around 
that you know you've got to be able to work back through that. The organization needs you to make the correct decision, even if it's the tough one for individuals or an individual in the business. Um, and then you can still deliver that message in an empathetic manner. Which leads us neatly into the fourth pair, uh, which is is bravery and engagement. So, Valerie, your understanding of, of the balance between these two? Um, I think bravery refers to being willing to step out. Um, it's the, I'm going to challenge the status quo. Um, I know we've always done it this way, but I need to understand why and how, and is there a better way? It's it's that kind of bravery. Um, we, I think that it takes bravery to do a number of these traits, but this is one that's very specific. And I think one of the pieces that's important is that if, if you're brave as a leader, you have to accept the fact that you're probably at some point going to be a positive disruptive force. You're going to be making things uncomfortable. Um, and the balance on this one, where it talks about bravery, but also engagement, is that you don't want to step out from the crowd and challenge something and then turn around, look behind you, and discover that everybody else is miles behind you um, and sort of looking at the sky and looking at the ground. And you want them with you. And so the engagement piece of this is bringing them with you. And I think that that involves both using some of the digital tools that we have and some of which have been around for quite a while, some of which are relatively new to help bring them with you. But I think that it also means that you have to accept the fact that a lot of us, Todd accepted probably, get very uncomfortable with change. And so part of the bravery is if you're going to challenge the status quo, if you're going to be that positive disruptive force. You need to help the people who are less comfortable with change move with you as well, because you want to make sure that when you turn around and look behind you, everybody's right with you because they understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how they can support you in doing it. I, I think one thing I'd add on to that that for me makes it um, the, the concept of, of bravery seem not so scary is there's really a question here of, you know, who's disrupting your business? Uh, would you rather it be you as the leader or would you rather it be the competitor? Um, because the business is going to be disrupted. I mean, that's just the nature of the world that we operate in now. So, you know, if you look across the spectrum, whatever it is, you know, taxis and Uber, hotels, Airbnb, et cetera, you know, industries are being disrupted at a macro level as well as at individual, you know, traditional competitive level. And, you know, Trying to lead through that kind of disruption as a leader puts you in the position of reacting and managing uh, chaos or uh, a, a situation that's potentially quite scary in the moment in terms of, of your market position and protecting it. Uh, having the foresight to be that disruptor yourself and consider what could happen or what's out there or what are the likely disruptions that could impact uh, the organization, now you're in a much better place in terms of, of thinking that through and not having to react uh, in the moment. Moving, moving on to the, the fifth pair, and that's that, that disruptive, ever-changing world you describe, Todd, kind of uh, requires a good element of creativity, but then also drive, Valerie. I'm actually, um, if I can, I want to kick this one back to Todd, um, primarily because the, the balance between creativity and drive is, is difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people find the creativity part of it um, either easy or difficult, and the drive part easy or difficult, but they find it very difficult to do both. Um, and Todd, I think you do this well, so I'd rather kick it back to you. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it does relate directly to that point about bravery, I think, John, because it's really about getting out of our comfort zone, about you know moving away from the old ways of doing business. I mean, just because something's working quite well now or a product is selling well or a market is going well, it doesn't mean it's going to be that way in the future. And so what you've got to do is to get people constantly creating and recreating and 
uh, you know, considering alternatives to that. I mean, one of the things that we've talked about a lot recently is, you know, we used to all talk about the old change curve model that would take you through all the stages of change, and it would sort of show that that would take some period for people to move through and adapt and, and recalibrate. Well, you know, the notion of that change curve now is, you know, a lot of very fast-paced sequential changes. Uh, we don't have the luxury of waiting 18 months to bring people over a hurdle and bring them along with us. And so what you've got to create is an atmosphere where people are comfortable, quite frankly, with the notion of constant change. Um, and that requires a different type of leadership. Um, you know, that requires creating safe zones, as Valerie was sort of talking about earlier, that people feel comfortable making mistakes and putting out ideas, even if they consider them to be wacky. Um, and you see where it gets you. Uh, but, but much like earlier when we were talking about curiosity, you've got to have some drive behind that because if you constantly stay in that state of flux, uh, it can lead to burnout for folks, uh, folks waiting out on initiatives because they figure you're going to change your mind again. So, you know, there has to be, again, some balance, and the balance has got to be that the ideas are moved forward in a very pragmatic and actionable way, that you have uh, action plans and follow-up, that you're sticking to a goal uh, and seeing it through. Um, and uh, again, the, the balance is really it, but get people moving through that change cycle as just a matter of course. This is the way business is now. If we're not changing, we'll be out of business. And then moving on to the final, um, the sixth and final uh, pair of traits, uh, if I could come back to you, Valerie, on the agility and attention. Well, Todd was talking about the, the rate at which things are changing, and I think everybody's been reading articles for quite some time now, actually, about how important it is for organizations and individuals to be agile, to be able to adapt to new circumstances and new situations. And leaders need, in particular, to exhibit that kind of agility. They need to be able to almost turn on a dime. So they need to be able to flux and move with the pace of change. But at the same time that they need to do that, they need to be able to focus. Um, and that's the attention piece. That's the focusing on the goal. That's the focusing on priorities. Sometimes when Todd was talking about if you have too much change going on, it drives people crazy. Sometimes if there are too many distractions because of all of the new things hitting at the same time, you lose the focus on where are we actually trying to go? What's the end result that we're after? So. I think one of the things that makes a really powerful leader today is the ability to adapt very quickly to all of these different distractions that we're finding but and pick out the ones that are crucial to deal with while keeping their eye firmly on where they want to end up at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, I find, um, I, I talk a lot about the difference between sequential thinking and sort of spatial thinking. I find that most people like a very pretty laid out path. They're very sequential. I'm going to do this. After that, I'll do this. Then I'll do this. And even on complex projects where you see, you know, the project management teams come in on the Gantt charts, you know, those things are really designed to lay out a path for something. And that's great because that does keep our attention on what the end state goal is. But Life is not sequential like that. There are spatial things happening around us all of the time. So you have to head down that path with enough attention and drive to get to the end state goal. But I think you need to be aware enough when something's changing or a new opportunity is coming in from right or left field that you say, hey, we hadn't planned on that, but what a great opportunity. If we did this, 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 it would drop us this much further on our path. Um, and I think a lot of people, even those that are very, very driven, are sequentially minded, sort of heads down, get to the end. Um, and, and when they get to the end, they may see that the circumstances have changed completely. Moving on slightly, Todd, um, Valerie mentioned that you you were very able to find a balance between one of those pairs, the creativity and drive, for example. I just want to talk a little bit more about the balance. I know we've mentioned it alongside a number of the traits, but it, is there anything, you, some insight you can give in a why the balance is so important and then, and how you strike that balance between these these traits that have the tension between them? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, balance is the key word across the entire concept. I mean, we know on anything. I mean, we talk about work-life balance all the time. We know the importance of 
a balanced meal. We know how uncomfortable it feels if we lose our balance. So, you know, everything needs to be in balance. Um, I remember years ago, there was a great book uh, that I loved called FYI, uh, which stood for For Your Improvement instead of For Your Information. But what it did, which I thought was really so key to the book, is that it talked about things in terms of being a strength or an overstrength rather than a strength or a weakness. And, and that concept really resonated with me. I mean, you can imagine how much better it is to tell somebody they're so good at something that it's having some unintended consequence rather than saying, you know, hey, this is a problem. Um, and I think when we look at these traits, I'm reminded of that because the concept of uh, that there's not a right or a wrong or a strength or a weakness, but everything depends upon a situation and specifically bringing some balance into that. So again, you know, if you look at curiosity and critical thinking, the pitfall there, I'm so curious about things I can never make a decision. Or empathy and decisiveness, I'm so worried about people's feelings that I avoid a tough decision. Or as I was just saying, agility, attention, I have a laser-like focus to the extent that I fail to see when the circumstance changes or there's a new opportunity. So for me, the concept of having uh, that balance is key and you need to have almost an intuition as a leader as to when you need to dial up or back on that spectrum, depending upon what's happening in the circumstance. Yeah, I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, and I think that the, almost the most important thing that, that Todd just said is that there's no, there's no balance that's predetermined. Um, you're going to have to look at it in each individual circumstance and decide where you need to be in terms of a proper balance. It's not as if you can say, I always need to spend 50% of my attention on this and 50% on that. It will differ from case to case. Bearing all these things in mind, um, especially around the, the, how dynamic and uh, disrupting everything is right now, um, as leaders, Valerie, uh, how can we refresh our skills, develop our skills, develop our thinking, modify our approaches, What's the way we do it? Well, that's the million dollar question, I guess. I think, I think that there are a variety of answers. I mean, sometimes you, some people benefit greatly from formal development. Um, some people benefit greatly by more informal development. I think the real key with these traits is almost awareness more than anything else. I think that this is something where we all learn all of the time. And some of the most effective learning is the learning that goes on in the moment. It's a question of keeping in the forefront of your mind that these are the behaviors that you want to exemplify because these are the ways that you want your team also to learn. And they'll learn from watching what you do. They'll they may not pay attention to what you say, but they'll always watch what you do. And if you are creating the space to be creative, if you are using new tools to communicate as broadly and transparently as you possibly can, if you are being brave enough and vulnerable enough to step out from the mob and to say, I don't know, your employees or your teammates or your colleagues will see that and echo it and they'll learn it from your behavior. So I think the biggest piece about learning this is remaining aware and finding ways to make yourself more conscious of when you are leaning too far towards one side of the trait pairing or too far towards the other. Todd, anything to add? Well, I mean, maybe to bring it back just for a moment to the, uh, you know, what's different about this and sort of the digital age. And I, I think what's comforting to me uh, as a leader is that as, as much as digital is disrupting or has the propensity to disrupt the business, um, thankfully it's giving back in equal if not greater measure in that we have more and more tools to help manage that process. Um, so, you know, I think the role of a leader, particularly as a facilitator now, um, and how we can engage people in the business and with their corporate life uh, for maximum return, we've, we've got more and more things at our disposal. Uh, and we need to continue to figure out how to take that even further. Um, you know, Valerie and I have worked together for 30 years. 
Um, we didn't even have email so when Valerie and I started working together. So, you know, when I wanted to talk to Valerie, I had to get up and physically walk around the building and, and go see her in her office and hope somebody wasn't in front of me. Um, you know, now, I mean, certainly email, but, you know, instant messaging and Skype and online communities and, you know, I can even make her a quick video and send it to her if I think she's missing me. You know, we've got uh, many, many more tools that allow us to engage the workforce to move through this era. But yet what's still lacking is we've not uh, really cracked what brings the same level of contagion, I would call it almost, to the corporate life that we see in our personal life. I mean, think about anything that, that, that you or your family would watch, you know, on end, you know, videos of others singing and dancing, um, putting cat faces on your photos, looking at pictures of houses for sale, you know, those kind of things that draw you in with such a passion, um, chances are you didn't think of a work-related app when I said that. So how do we create that same level of contagion on matters of the business? And what makes people want to connect and interact on business topics in that same way? And to me, that's the key that a leader in the digital age needs to be figuring out. So is that, Todd, as well as being, as well as the awareness that Valerie talked about, it's actually the, the wanting to engage with all these things and actually, I suppose it, it, cut, it cuts across all the traits because it's, it's bravery, it's curiosity, it's all those things combined together will do, make that crossover that you're talking about from the, the private sphere to the, to the corporate yeah. sphere. Well, and where you're, where you're learning from as well. I mean, it's, um, you know, the traditional mode of going to a class and the leader having then, uh, you know, a deeper skill set uh, or greater knowledge and then coming back and imparting that down through the business. I mean, we used to struggle, you know, even a decade ago that the topics were around how to get the leaders to cascade messages, the strategy or the operations or the learning you know, that's just all reversed now. I mean, it's a complete mix-up, which is a great thing. And anybody can share up, down, sideways. And, um, you know, you've got to be open to learning uh, from everybody around you. Yeah. Valerie, agreed? Absolutely. I think, I think one of the things that Todd alluded to when we very first started this was that leaders today are all over the organization. They're simply the people that other people choose to follow. Um, they're not managers or supervisors necessarily. They can be anywhere. And what you want is to get all of the people who can be leaders to be leaders and make that crossover. That's great. Thank you both very much for your time. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Valerie.